Um, all right, so um, I'm gonna go ahead and start session for today. Um, so I did get assignment three back. Uh, so you should be able to see now the comments on assignment three uh, in your GitHub repository. Um, today, I, I, I thought I'd take maybe 10 minutes and kind of show some example solutions for the, the, the recursive functions at least. So since unit three was supposed to be about recursion, I don't wanna spend too long on that. And then as usual, um, I'll get started on assignment four and talk a little bit about the tasks and things. So um, yeah, so don't forget, you know, you, You've got the quiz still today and then the assignment four. Um, and, you know, I mentioned this, I think, last time, but there is also um, our first test. So the first test will be open starting tomorrow. It, it's like a two hour uh, time test, um, I believe. I'll, I'll check that, but that's what I believe it is. Uh, so th that means you, you can start any time between now and I think I have it open till um, Saturday. It should show up on the calendar here. So, um, um, yeah, it's due by the 18th, um, which is, uh, yeah, Saturday. So you can take it, you know, uh, Thursday or Friday, um, or if you're a weekend person, you could work out on, on Saturday. So, um, but yeah, don't forget about the first test. So I've already got, um, kind of an example solution here. Uh, most people, I had about half the people get fully through, half the people that are still working on assignments get about fully through um, this one. And then almost everybody at least got started and got the first task or two. Um, but uh, uh, a lot of people didn't get all six of the tasks. We're usually up to task two or four, getting the first uh, two functions working. Um, so I thought it might be useful. Uh, as usual, feel free to interrupt. If you have questions at any time, we can go off um, if anybody wants to ask anything. Um, but let's, um, let, me, let me just discuss for maybe five or 10 minutes the um, um, recursive functions here. So, um, so um, there's, there's a question about, uh, if you ever get a segmentation violation, um, that means that your program um, is crashing um, and most likely there's some sort of a memory issue, memory corruption. Um, are you seeing the segmentation violation for the the task for the assignment three or are you working on assignment four right now? Assignment three, okay. Um, so most likely um, on task two, let me look at my own. Um, so task two would have been the recursive version of summing the list. Um, yeah, I mean, it's hard to say. I'd be happy to see, um, uh, I'd probably have to look at the code to debug it. So uh, there's a couple of, of um, things that I can, um, uh, some hints to give you for debugging crashes. So uh, let me see, I, I could probably force a segmentation violation um, like on my code, for example. Um, here, I wouldn't be able to do it with the list because we're, we're the, the, one of the things of the list is it protects uh, um, accesses beyond the end of the array. But, but a common reason why you get a segmentation violation in a C or C++ program, especially when you're doing dynamic memory allocation, um, is if you have an array, let's say, um, say an array of 10 values, uh, and you do something that ends up um, accessing uh, a value beyond the end of the array. You know, so like, uh, you know, if I, I only allocate enough room on the stack for 10 values, but I try to access the value at position or index 1000, you know, this is way beyond the bounds of this. So most likely this will cause a segmentation violation if I run this, right? So this will compile fine because C++ and C arrays can't really check that you're not illegally trying to access beyond the end of an array. But, but this is a common kind of thing that will cause a crash because basically if you're accessing beyond the end of the array, the reason why it crashes is you try to access memory that your process doesn't own. Um, 
And um, um, that's a common reason for a segmentation violation or, or a type of crash because memory is protected. Only the process that owns that memory should be able to access that. So if you're accessing something on, on a page that you don't own, uh, the uh, the hardware will actually generate, you know, the, the crash is actually being generated by the hardware um, and that will um, um, result in, in, in commonly a, seg a segmentation violation. You can get other different types of crashes, but something like that. So let's we'll see if that does um, um, segment violate. So uh, it's not going to compile unless I do something to actually uh, read a value out of it. Um, so so let's rebuild that. And then let's try running it. So um, when I run my tests, um, we should see da, 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 that um, I did force a, a seg fault. Um, although you didn't, I didn't get the maybe not exactly the same thing that you're seeing here. So, but like I said, probably unless I look at specifically at the code, um, you know, so I see something else might be happening. It might be something else besides memory corruption. But if I am seeing a crash, what I wanted to say, uh, just as a hint, is um, my first step on doing that is I really want to know what test was causing the segmentation violation. And when you when you do the, uh, the, the the tests here, it only shows the 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 failing test. It doesn't show which doesn't show all the tests that are run. So one good first step is you know my, my question is okay which test actually did I get to uh, when the segmentation violation occurred here? Um, so. Um, it, it, you know, so you can run the test by hand by doing dot slash test. The, again, the default is to only show the, the successful tests. Uh, but if you add like a flag to these to, to the test uh, executable, um, what it's um, I can't remember the flag here. Um, uh, dash S, I think dash S. This will show not only not only the failing test, but it'll also show the successful test running as well. So you see all tests. You can do dash S or dash dash success, same thing. So what you'll see is a lot more output when you do that. Uh, in particular, so it's maybe not going to be a good example here, but um, I was expecting for task two to be causing segmentation violation here. Um, so if I can find task two. So there's the sum iterative. And here's the the some recursive tests here. Um, so yeah, my segmentation violation. I, I'm actually causing one to happen, but it doesn't seem to be happening until really near the end. So let me let me be even more aggressive. Let me see if we um, go even further out in memory here. If I can force it right away. Whoops. There we go. All right, so that rebuilt. Let me, let me try that again. We'll run the tests. Um, so yeah, I think I'm forcing the, the seg fault, the crash earlier now. So, so now I'm, I'm seeing more of what I'm expecting. It's only getting to, um, Two test cases or three test cases before it passes here. So, um, so again, if if, if we try the uh, with the dash s flag to show all of the um, successful tests, what I'm expecting is you know if we go back to the top here, um, that um, you know basically I'm seeing that it got you know down to test. 217, 218, 219 uh, to the test on 222. Um, and then I didn't see anything after that, right? So, so again, this is kind of a hint, or this is this is can help us out to um, um, see a bit better here. So we got all the way down to like 218, 219, oops, on the tests here. Uh, 
um, down to here. And then basically we didn't see this test run here. So the crash happened uh, here, which, which, you know, makes sense. But, but this kind of helps narrow it down. So if you're not certain uh, where the, the crash is happening, I have found out that it got down here, but we didn't run the test here. So let me show that again. So um, So again, running these, you know, I see it come down here, run the test on 219, 222. Um, I got my screen too big here. Oh, there it is. Um, so yeah, 219, 222. Um, and that's the last one that we see here. So that's telling me that that probably my, my crash, my segmentation fault happened on this test here, right? And then from there, I, you know, I either get the debugger working um, and step through this, or you can still, you know, do print out debugging, you know, so, so since we've narrowed it down, that's probably happened in the sum recursive, you know, we could um, um, put, do a little bit of print out debugging, so. Um, something like that. So put an output statement so we can tell whether we entered into the function. And um, yeah, I don't really need any more because I know that I'm kind of forcing the, the, the crash here, but you know, we could add more things in here if, uh, if we find that it's getting to this point, but not past it, or getting past this point, but we're not certain where exactly. So, um, So we actually somehow got to this point, we actually got past the place where I'm forcing the segmentation crash to happen. So now if we run it again, on the successful tests, uh, we should see it come down here, um, but uh, but you know I'm, I'm seeing my print out my my C out uh, debugging here, so I know that I at least got to that point, uh, but I didn't get I didn't see the the second message here, right? But yeah, by 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 first narrowing it down to exactly which function is crashing, and then you need to narrow it down to exactly which line of code is causing the crash, and then from there, then then you have to start thinking about okay, am I somehow what am I doing? You know, am I, I'm corrupting memory or freeing something I shouldn't or going past the end of an array or something like that. So. All right. But yeah, if that doesn't, yeah. So if that doesn't, uh, you know, try it yourself first. And if you still don't find it, I'm, I'm happy to, you know, if people send me their code, um, I can always look at them. Those, those are the hardest kinds of things to find and fix. So the hardest kinds of things to debuggers if you're having a crash, right? So if, if you're having the segmentation, violations or a seg fault or a double free or some other kind of corruption. Um, and you first have to recognize that you're not actually running all your tests, that you're crashing somewhere, you get in a runtime crash. Um, and then then you have to kind of narrow it down and, and figure out where it's happening, what's causing it. But, uh, but yeah, that's all the kind of stuff that you kind of learn um, about uh, how to debug well. You know, to, to be a good debugger, um, as a programmer, I mean, you have to kind of cultivate a scientific mindset. So you really need to, to get good at, you know, uh, coming up with an hypothesis for what might be causing this um, and being able to set up experiments to narrow it down. So if I have two pretty things, so, you know, what, again, like I'm saying, the suggestion here, the first step is you need to try and narrow it down to find out which function and which line is is actually causing the, the crash or the corruption or whatever. So that, that's always kind of your first step is, is trying to experiment to get to that point. So all right. Um anyway, so um I'll just carry on then 
with um, what I was going to originally say. So I, just for everybody else, I kind of wanted to maybe talk one or two things this is, um, about recursive functions. You know, so it seemed like almost everybody, except for maybe one person, um, you know, were getting it, were at least able to write uh, the first recursive function or the first two. So, so a, a, a basic um, uh, example solution for the sum recursive is, so notice here, um, I mean, you know, as I discussed last time, um, uh, you could have two special kind of base cases, but I, I am able to handle um, them uh, with just one base case here. So, so basically this base case is only handling the case where we give it an empty list so for example, if uh, begin is one uh, or begin is zero and end is negative one. Um, so, so only for, um, this was kind of the definition of how our sum recursive was supposed to work or how we defined an empty list or an empty sub list, right? But, but we're supposed to return a zero for that. So, so we detect that. So this works though, even for the case where begin is equal to end. So what happens for the, you know, so, in this, it, uh, the, the general principle here is you, you want to try and um, not have in unnecessary code, right? So if I can, if I can have code that handles uh, the, the the case where I've only got one value, where begin is equal to end, um, uh, instead of having a special case, a special base case for that, it, it's better. You know, this reduces code complexity if um, you know if, if we remove unnecessary code. So here, this works for the case uh, where we where begin is equal to end or where end is greater than begin. So where we have two or more items. So where we have one, two or more items in the list, this recursive implementation works because basically, for example, if begin is equal to end, we access the value out of uh, begin in right so let's say begin and end are both zero so we get the value out of list zero and then we add that to calling some recursive but of course we call begin plus one so now if begin and end were zero we're going to call recursive with begin of one and end of zero but that will hit you know the base case the the, the idea that the sub list we're asking to sum up is empty so that will return zero so we'll end up adding the value at index zero to the zero that's returned from the recursive call Right. Um, and likewise, this works then, you know, if, if uh, begin, if end is greater than begin and not equal, right? So if begin was zero and end was one, the first time we come in here, we would access the value at list uh, zero, and then we would say some recursive from, you know, begin plus one from one to one. And that would uh, that would come in here um, and get the value out of one and call it for a third recursive call. Um, actually, you know, <laughs> whenever I start doing these things, uh, there's one that I, go, talking about the de debugger again. Um, this would be worthwhile uh, 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 making certain that recursive function calls are related to the function call stack. So it's worthwhile understanding um, kind of what's happening here and what we mean by function call stack. So, for example, let me um, um, let me open up main here and let me call make a call to um, um, some recursive where we give it a list of size two here. So, um, let's say, for example, um, so this list had size one had just one value in it. Uh, but I'll change it here. So, so we'll, we'll call it um, so that we have a list with uh, two values, uh, say five and three, right? Um, so this list is a size of two with those values in it, and we want to sum up all the values from, from index zero to index one, right? Um, I'm going to do a clean build here. And I'm going to go ahead and run a debug session. Um, and kind of like I showed last time, I think I've got this set up so that, um, oh, so by default, if you don't add in configuration, uh, the, the, the default GNU debugger launch will launch uh, a debug session using the main 
um, uh, the standalone main executable here. So, th so the executable called uh, debug. So um, let's go ahead and launch that. Um, so in our debugger, we start off in the main function here um, and we can step over, step over, step over, and then I'm going to step in here, right? So now, so, so here, pay attention to the call stack over here. So, so we start off in the main function. We're going to step into some, some recursive, given the parameters zero for begin and one for end, right? So let's step into that. So now we made our first function call to some recursive here. So um, I don't need the debug console, okay? So now we're here um, on the stack uh, where, you know, begin, um, um, these might not be the right values till I step, actually get stepped into the function here. So yeah, here we are. So um, that can be a little bit confusing, but yeah, until I actually get in here. So this was our first call to the function. So in our scope now for the first function call, begin is zero, end is one, um, you know, and we've got this list that's passed in. That we're not gonna be able to see, but um, 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 it has a size of two um, and it has the values five and three at index zero and index one respectively here. So, um, so in this case, you know, begin is not greater than end. So what happens is uh, it won't do that. It won't hit the base case. It'll hit the general case. Okay. So now, if we step into this, uh, we're going to be calling some recursive, but from one to one. So begin, begin is zero. So we add uh, one to, to begin and call some recursive um, to sum up the the sublist from index one to index one. So step into that. Um, so um, yeah, so this is another thing of debugging. So when I stepped in, it actually stepped into the overloaded operator of list. It's not quite where I wanted to be. So I'm gonna step um, step over this stuff till we return here. Um, so let's try stepping in again here. So now we actually stepped into the summer. So, so the first time it actually stepped into my operator, my overloaded operator for the list there. But now we're stepping into the sum recursive. So this is a recursive function call here. So I'm now uh, on my function call stack. I'm on the second um, call to sum recursive. Um, and again, now on this call though, begin index is one and end index is one, right? Um, and uh, again, we don't hit the base case yet, uh, the way that I showed in this example implementation. So um, if um, um, it's a little bit annoying, I guess I, I could set a breakpoint here and just continue and break it, but I'll just go ahead and um, step in. So we'll step back into the operate overloaded operator again step till we step out of that and then step in again. So we should step into the sub recursive call. So this will be our third version of the recursive call in the stack, all right? So now we're in sub recursive the, for the third time uh, with the begin index of two and an in index of one, right? Notice um, again, it, uh, all, all these values of begin and in were created locally on the stack. So begin and in for this, um, function call on the stack um, are different variables and you can actually step through these. So if I want to go back to this function call of, of some recursive on my function call stack, I can click on there. So at this, uh, what's known as the stack frame, um, uh, begin was one and end was one, right? And, and the first stack frame, the first call to sub recurs some recursive, uh, begin was zero and end was one, right? Um, anyway, so you know, that's kind of how recursion is working here. Um, and in this case, we're finally going to end the recursion because uh, begin is greater than end. So this will return a result of zero. Um, and now we're going to be returning zero back from our function call. So when I hit return again, we're going to pop off our third recall, third call to some recursive off the function call stack and be back into the, the, the scope of the second call to some recursive. So now we're here, it's, it's actually returning zero as the result here, we're adding zero to uh, the value at list um, begin, which was one here, right? Um, 
So the result of that is to the list at index one is a three. So the result of that will be to return three from this uh, uh, call to the function. Um, and that'll pop off that call to some recursive. So now three is being returned from here and that'll be added to the list at index zero because bin, begin is zero now at, for our first call of the function. So we'll get the three plus five, you know, which is what we're expecting here, an, an eight result. So. Oops, um, all right. So if I step over that, it'll pop off the final call and we'll be back to main here, right? Probably should have gotten that value and output it to show that it was eight, but um, but yeah, we should have got eight returned from calling some recursive there. So. All right. Um, Anyway, so I hope that was kind of useful. You know, a little bit more about the. I didn't, I hadn't thought about doing that, but uh, but yeah, I mean, I think I think it's definitely useful for those people watching this. So that's a little bit about you know using the debugger, kind of what this call stack is, you know, what the difference is between things that are statically allocated on the stack. So all these times we called some recursive, we were we were getting new stack frames which had the you know the begin and end and list parameters uh, although we're passing this by reference so you know we don't make a copy of the list we're just passing it around like a pointer to it but but we're we are passing these by value so we're making um uh, new values on our stack and, and copying in the old value or whatever value is passed in when we call the function here um so anyway that that's that's an example of tail recursion um let's look at the reverse recursive so um this is one of the the um the uh the uh the uh, true false questions on the quiz i think here so i mean you know you can have recursive functions that uh, don't return a result so the basically this is an example of a recursive function uh it's not returning a result it, it basically as a side effect it's um modifying the list right so since we pass in the list by reference anything we do to this list for example you know swapping the values or reversing the values will be seen in the caller right um, and, and again here you know I, I know a lot of people use like two base cases but you can simplify the code you can get it down to one base case and then like a general case right so if, if begin is greater than or equal to and so if it's greater than then the list is is empty if it's equal then the list is of size one in both cases there's nothing to do for the reverse so you can just return uh, whatever sublist you were ask, asking to reverse um you know the reverse of a sublist of size zero one is by definition just that same sublist right so we catch both of those cases with the one base case here right? oh notice uh, you know i've been pinging people you know do put in make a habit of putting in inline comments so give give context to the readers of your code so um otherwise if you followed most people did it this way correctly for the reverse recursive that got task four completed and so the the general case is just swap the begin and end so so we just do do in here in this example we do a, a standard three lines of code to get one of those that we want to swap into a temporary variable um, and then swap um, that value that we saved the other value to the one that we saved and then swap that temporary in there right so something there is a there is a um Um, there is a standard template uh, library algorithm function called swap that some people knew about. So, uh, later on in this course, we might talk about the standard template library, but that's something you might want to look up. So there is actually a function that would um, part of the, the standard template library that would um, swap these for you. So that's another way to do that. But, you know, it's good to reuse code. So uh, probably if I was really doing this myself, I would use the standard template library instead of doing it by hand there. Um, um, and then, yeah, anyway, so the recursive part of this is that um, uh, if, if we swap the, the values at the two endpoints, then to completely reverse the, the list, uh, we have to recursively then swap the, the, the middle bits that we didn't um, um, reverse yet, right? So we can just call reverse recursive on the middle bit, you know, the, the begin index plus one and the end index minus one. Uh, 
Um, so, um, and then finally, um, let me show you an example implementation of the palindrome recursive, just you know, to talk more about recursive. So, so here again, uh, this is a function that does return a result, but it's just returning true or false, right? Um, this is an example of, I, I tried to demonstrate using, um, I mentioned this in the most recent announcement here. So to minimize nesting, this is becoming, I see a lot, a lot of people kind of um, emphasizing this as a code style kind of thing. In particular, uh, like large levels, levels of nesting are considered to be a kind of a bad code smell. Uh, it makes it more difficult if, if you've got like an implementation that has three, four, or more nested levels. I try to never have code that has more than two levels of nesting nowadays, All right? So for example, um, in this function, I'm doing something called uh, early return, right? So instead of having like nesting, you might want to check for error cases or special cases um, and then just return whenever you see those, right? Because basically the the if, if, if you have a, a function that's returning, um, if it hits that, it won't go past that. So you don't have to have like if else's, uh, which might require multiple nesting if you're doing those. So you can use this kind of idea of early return here. So, um, so we're using that kind of as an example here um, in order to keep that we only have, you know, one, no, well, two levels of nesting if you consider, you know, the, the functions are one level um, and then inside the bodies of the if statements are our second level of nesting here. So. So for this recursive implementation and this example solution, uh, we check um, um, the base case for both of the base cases. If, if the size of the list is zero, so if it's an empty list or if it's a, 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 a sublist is size one. So, you know, if, if it begins greater than, you know, then it's an empty list by our definition of how these lists work, or if they're equal, it's um, a size one list. In both cases, though, the result is the same. So empty lists or size one lists by definition are palindrome. So we should return true, right? Um, otherwise, we know that the list has two or more values in it, okay? So at that point, the idea is that uh, only if the begin and end indexes are equal, could it possibly be um, a palindrome, okay? So we can immediately check. So, so the, this, uh, what we call the short circuiting return, if the, the begin and end are not equal, we immediately know the answer is false. So again, we don't have to do any recursion. If we ever get to a point um, where, you know, the two endpoints need to be equal for it to be a palindrome and they're not, the answer is false. It's not a palindrome. Otherwise, if we get past that, we know that it's potentially a palindrome and we know that begin and end for the size two or larger list are equal. So the answer is gonna be, okay, well, if the middle bit again is a palindrome, then the whole list is a palindrome. So whatever the result of calling is palindrome recursive gives us um, for the middle bit, so begin plus one to end minus one, that's the result that we're gonna return. So some people um, had a little bit of difficulty with that that got to task two, um, but, but yeah, you know, so if, if you get this far correctly, it still might not be a, a palindrome. So you have to test that middle part that you're not sure about yet recursively. And whatever it tells you true or false is what you want to return um, as your result here. So. All right. Um, so anyway, those are the examples, you know, and, and I think those are useful to review that. Hopefully, hopefully people are um, watching these um, help sessions. Um, um, but uh, but yeah, I, I do want to get over to assignment four here, unless uh, you, um, unless you wanted to ask something here before I move on. Um, so assignment four, we're doing some stuff with searching and sorting. Um, so I haven't actually done that assignment yet. So let me go ahead and get started on that. Oops, did I close? I think I closed off my. Um, I got, got to get back into the class here so I can um, get the, oops, wrong one. So I can get the URL.
All right, so um, assignment four, you should find under the unit four, 4.2, the second part of the unit four here. Um, wait, as usual, I'll go and copy that. Um, and I'll accept it over here where I'm logged into GitHub as the my student account here. So we've now got our assignment for repository. Um, so let's, uh, you know, um, let's go ahead and clone it then. It's the second step usually. So I'll copy that. Clone it to my sync folder. Um, and then, yeah, um, we'll we'll go through our steplets, our, our checklist steps here. So as usual, um, we'll configure and uh, confirm things building and running, um, and then maybe create our tasks, and then we can get started on task one there. So, um, so yeah, you, you'll normally get these messages if you don't have the, if you didn't run the configure step. Uh, so most likely reason why it says you need to configure your IntelliSense. So. Um, So we'll configure, uh, we'll check everything's building still uh, and the keyboard shortcuts are working. And we'll check that the tests are running um, and um, initially the test should all be running um, um, or if there are either no tests will be running or yeah, again, so the, in this assignment, there are some tests that are uncommented but they should all be passing if there are any tests running um, when you start an assignment here, so. And, um, Just do a real quick check that the auto formatter, um, the CLang auto formatter for our code, our class style is being um, formatted. So we're getting indentation and everything. So uh, IntelliSense is detecting that these variables are undefined. So, so everything, that's what you should see whenever you start an assignment like this. Um, okay. Um, in this uh, assignment, uh, we're working. We've got a list class again, uh, but this time you're going to be adding member functions into the list class. Okay, so we're we're we're, we're going to be implementing a what's known as a merge sort. Okay, so uh, in the lecture materials for this week, uh, we talked about some basic sorts like bubble sort and selection sort and insertion sort, um, and we also talked a little bit about like quick sort and things, I believe. So this is another example of of a. Um, so, so merge sort is another example of a uh, sort uh, that's considered a good sort compared to bubble sort or something like that. So it, it runs in, in login time, right? Which is about, which is the best you can do uh, for sorting algorithms. So, so it, it's known if you watch the lecture videos and the materials I gave you, you know, it, it, it is known that uh, you can't do any better uh, than in login for a sort, except for very special um, kind of situations. So, um, yeah, we're actually going to be implementing a sort and a search. We're going to be adding those as member functions uh, for our list class here, right? So, so we're going to be back to actually adding code into list.hpp uh, and list.cpp, all right? So the first three tasks to implement a copy constructor um, and a merge function, uh, the first two are going to be functions that you need to make it to make it pretty sim uh, to make it trivial to implement the merge sort into the sort function, right? So, so if we implement these first two correctly, uh, we can implement a recursive merge sort re by reusing the copy constructor and the merge function in like three or four lines of code. So um, you know, we give an algorithm here. So I'm probably mostly gonna be talking about these first three tasks here. So um, let's talk about this. So um, um, the first one is to implement a sublist copy constructor, okay? So again, this is more practice on classes um, and object-oriented programming in C++ here. Um, so um, kind of like before, there, there is one test case that's uh, uncommented uh, to start with that's testing this list class. So as you can see, it, I think it's actually the same as we had for the previous assignment. So the, the list class, 
Oh, except it's a list of strings instead of a list of integers. So, so, it, so it holds list of strings this time. Um, but but it keeps track of the size and, and you can index the values into the list. So we've overloaded the indexing operator and you can test if two lists are equal and so on. Um, so there's examples of using the list here. So the first test case for task one, if you uncomment it, is we're, is you're gonna be implementing a constructor that does this, okay? So notice we've got a list called L1 that has five strings in it. So it has these five strings in it, right? Now we're gonna create a second list that invokes a copy constructor. So we pass in L1 and we pass in a begin and end in that end index like you did for the functions for the previous assignment. But here these specify the start and end index inclusive of the values that should be copied over to create the new list L2 here, right? So the, the result of this is that, that L2 should be a list that's of size three that has the, the values uh, from index zero, one, and two of list one that were passed in, right? So that, that's the result that we're expecting um, after invoking the, the copy constructor here, all right? So, you know, um, Um, you know, as usual, since I uncommented that, if I do a make clean, if I do a make, uh, it won't be building now um, because um, um, this here on lines 171, there's no constructor for the list class that looks like that, that takes three parameters, okay? So we need to add that, or we need to start by adding the, um, the prototype uh, for the member function here. So, you know, as usual, um, here you should go to, to list.hpp for this, assignment and be adding your declarations or your function signature prototypes to the header file of the list class. Okay? So you're already, you already have a um, copy constructor that, that copies the whole list. Um, so we need another constructor, right? So, so here, I know this confuses things. So it confuses people sometimes. So we're not adding like a member function with a name. We're adding a member function that's a little bit special. It's a, it's a, constructor for the class, right? So constructors will all have the same name, they'll have the same names of the class, but you can have multiple constructors, you know, which we talked about back in unit two here, as long as the signatures are different. So in this case, um, and, oh, and I apologize last time that I, you know, said it needs to be constant, um, um, and I was a little bit wrong on that. Um, but, uh, but yeah, this time, you know, like the, full copy constructor, the first parameter is gonna be a constant reference to a list, but we have additional parameters. This time, right? So, um, um, so your implementation of the um, sublist copy constructor will be similar to the full copy constructor. So this is a good starting point is what I'm saying. It's just that you need to uh, figure out the size from the um, um, indexes that you're given and only copy those values um, from the index there. So, so anyway, um, yeah, once you add that, um, you know, it should actually be happier compiling because we've now got the declaration for constructors that have that signature, take three parameters, uh, but we'll get link errors um, um, that um, um, we don't actually have an implementation of that sublist copy constructor here. So, um, so we need to add that constructor into list.cpp. So let me first look at the, um, uh, the, the copy constructor, right? So here's the copy constructor that takes uh, a reference to a list, a constant reference to a list as input. And notice what it does is it sets the size of this list to the size of the list that comes in as our input parameter. It dynamically creates an array of strings, so a new array of strings uh, into our values array um, of that size. And then it just copies all the values um, um, from the uh, uh, input list values into this new list that we're co copying 
making a copy of in our copy constructor, right? So this is a common implementation of what's known as a copy constructor here, right? So, um, so if it was me, I would start by just copying uh, the copy constructor. So we get the function documentation. Um, so as I told some people, you know, function documentation shouldn't be an afterthought. You should do this before um, your first commit of the function here. And if you're copying documentation like I just did here, you should read it over and, and update it uh, to be correct for your new function, okay? So, so we're providing a sublist copy constructor this time. Um, Uh, I think there's a way to reflow these. I can't remember how to do it uh, instead of having to need to, you know, try and keep the align links here. I'll have to look that up. So anyway, so we want a sublist copy constructor that will be invoked whenever you assign one instance to another. Um, um, Sorry. Um, so, I mean, yeah, it looks a little bit different here. So, um, the way we're doing the test is we're using, we're, we're explicitly invoking this sublist copy constructor. So, okay. So this copy constructor, uh, this the sublist copy constructor should make a copy of the values uh, from the government input list, but only of those indicated values from begin to end inclusive. All right. We've got these additional parameters. Um, Begin index is the beginning index of the sublist to be copied. This list. And the end index is the ending index inclusive sublist to be copied to this new list. All right. Um, as usual, I mean, you know, you know, this is a member function. So we've got the it's a member constructor function, but you know, it's got the list colon colon in front of all member function names, including constructors and destructors. Uh, and then always make certain that your signature. So I had some people, for example, uh, in the previous assignment, one person was having problems because they were declaring um, their function to be returning a double, but then in the implementation file, they had it returning an int, okay? But you, I mean, your signatures have to exactly match or you're gonna get compilation errors or other kinds of errors. So, you know, again, in this case, you know, you should be careful, but, um, you know, I'm taking three parameters, a constant list reference um, and uh, two uh, integer value parameters here. So, I'll just copy and paste those. Um, and yeah, that's enough for a stub function, right? So, you know, um, 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 that should actually allow it to compile and run. Uh, but since we're not doing anything, it, it won't pass the test or it might even crash since I'm not actually initializing the memory. So, you know, I might want to at least do something like um, initialized size and uh, so you know if you look back to like the empty constructor um the the default i guess we don't have a, a, a standard we don't have like an empty constructor so there is a default constructor that implements and that creates an empty list uh for of a given size um and it just sets all the values to be empty strings um um, so, but, but yeah, so, but, but, you know, initially we, we set size to some size and we set the, the values array to be a null pointer. Um, 
Anyway, so that's all I'm doing here for the stub function. Um, so if I didn't make a mistake, it should compile cleanly this time. So no compile errors or link errors. Um, and it should run the tests, um, although we will get um, the test will be failing, which you know we kind of expect. So uh, in particular, the, so the first one that's failing, um, you know, um, we're expecting the size to be three and that, that it has these values in the list after we um, copy that list. So, um, All right. And uh, yeah, I mean, just to give hints, so that's all the code I'm going to give uh, probably for today, but because uh, I want to talk about merge here. But, um, you know, so uh, I mean, you have to do basically uh, you know, so your size isn't the list that size. Your size is going to be depend on what the in index and be, begin index, right? So if in index is two um, and begin index is zero, like this, you actually need to have a size of three. So that's the like the difference of those plus one actually, right? Um, and um, then the only other thing, um, I mean, you can copy the values like this in in a loop. But be careful. So like if I have three values, I need my index over here to go from 0, 1, 2. But um, um, sorry, but it's not always the case that I'm copying 0 to 0, 1 to 1, and 2 to 2. All right. Does that make sense? So for example, if you look at these tests, like, like if I want a sublist from uh, of list 1 again, but from 2 to 4, it's also size 3. But I'm, I'm copying index two to index zero of my new list. So, so Trinity ends up at index zero, um, Cypher at index one, and Oracle. At two. Okay. So, um, so yeah, I mean that 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 just means that your your loop, you know, uh, these the, on the left hand side need to go from zero up to the size, but on the right hand side you need to uh, take into account, you know, your begin in and in, begin index and end index uh, as the the where you're reading from to copy to. Oh. All right, questions about that? That's your basic sublist copy constructor. Um, now, um, probably the trickiest function actually is the merge function. If you can get this working, um, as I think I already mentioned, I mean, the, the implementing a sort, a recursive merge sort um, is like a three or four liner uh, where you reuse the copy constructor. Um, uh, actually, you reuse the copy constructor twice um, and you do a recursive call um, on, on each of those sublists and then you use the merge function um, that you need to implement here on task two. Um, So again, for me, it's easier if we just look at what it's supposed to do. So I'm trying to explain it. So let's let's look at the test case test cases for um, task three. Um, so this is the most basic. All right. So um, if we have a list with two values in it, Cipher and Neo. And we have another list with, with two values in it, uh, Morpheus and Trinity. Uh, if you call merge, and now one thing as a prerequisite, all these values have to be in um, sorted order. So they're going to be in alphabetical order. So the, the merge, the result of the merge, if the two lists that you're merging together are in sorted order, the merge list will also be in sorted order. So notice that the resulting list has all four values that we merge from what I call the lower and the upper list. Uh, but but Cypher, uh, since alphabetically came first, ended up at index zero. But then we got the value uh, with the M at index one from the upper list. And then Neo came from the lower list. And then Trinity came from the upper list. All right. So, so, so merge is expecting two sorted small lists um, as input. Um, and then in, in linear time, so just in a single pass um, um, uh, through each of these lists, um, it can create the new uh, resulting merge list. Um, um, and, and the values will be in sorted order. 
for the merged left hand. Uh, another thing, I mean, we uh, we could have done this slightly differently, but we do expect that you actually pass in a, a list uh, that, that the result that you're merging the, the two lists uh, together into uh, is big enough to hold the, the result, okay? So in this case, since the result is gonna have four values in it after we do the merge, um, um, the, the list we're calling merge on, uh, we create an empty list of size four um, uh, to merge those results into. Um, um, so basically it's, it's, it's a little tricky. Um, the basic idea is this, um, and uh, yeah, here, here's kind of cases where I kind of wish I had a, a whiteboard, but but um, um, you need to keep track of the index that you're currently at at both of the lists. Um, and I'm, I'm kind of calling these lower and upper um, in the description of the algorithm here, right? Um, and what you do, so so here, uh, when we come into the merge function, you know, we, we've got the two lists as input, um, lower and upper, right? Um, and you can find the size of these lists, you know, because if you're in a member function here, you can ask for lower dot size and upper dot size to know how many values are in each list. Uh, you have to create like two temporary variables, like, like the lower, current lower index and the current upper index, which would start at zero, all right? Um, and then what you need to do is compare the, 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 that index of the two rays and whichever is alphabetically smaller, um, you're going to copy into the result, um, um, the values array in result, all right? So here, you know, if, if current index is, um, for, for this first example, if current index is zero for both upper and lower, when we compare the value in lower index zero to value upper index zero, the one at lower is the alphabetically smaller, right? So we would copy cipher from lower um, into the values in the result array. We would increment the, the lower, the current lower index by one. So now current lower index will be pointing to index one, where the current upper index is still pointing to index zero. And we have to keep doing that until either lower um, or upper have no more values in it. Right, so it may or may not be a little bit tricky to detect that, but um, um, so, so you repeat this until one of those arrays is empty. So one of those arrays will become empty before the other, right? So uh, at the state that I just described, as I'm talking about it here, you know, now the current index is one for the lower and the current index is zero. So now, again, we need to compare those, but, but this time um, M comes alphabetically before N. So M is less than N. So we would copy the upper value to index one of our result values, and we would increment the upper, the current upper index to be one, right? So, so after that, we copied cipher to index zero. We ended up copying morphics to index one. Both the current indexes are at one um, for, for upper and lower. So then you compare again, um, N comes alphabetically before T. So we would end up copying Neo to index two of the result um, and incrementing um, the uh, uh, current lower index to be index two, right? And at that point, um, then um, we've exhausted all the values in the lower array, but there's still one value in the upper array that needs to be copied. So training needs to come from here to that, right? So uh, after you're done with that, the easiest way to do this is to have two more loops that copies all the remaining values from lower uh, to the array and all the values from upper to the array, right? But one of these, um, the, the current index is gonna be greater than or equal to the size of the array because you exhausted it, right? So if you do your, or you could do an if statement as well, um, uh, um, although you can make it cleaner by just writing your loop uh, terminating condition correctly, right? So if I have a loop that goes from the, the current index, the current lower index to, uh, uh, you know, the size, since the current index is equal to the size, that loop wouldn't execute any times when I try to copy over any remaining from lower. But the current upper index um, is one for the upper array that has two values. So the loop should execute one time in that case and copy that remaining value out of upper 
uh, to the end of the results. All right. So there are some some things, some some some, some bookkeeping to keep track of there. Uh, but hopefully the, the the goal, you know. So if you understand the goal, um, that should help you to, to clarify what you're doing here, right? So you're taking two so already sorted smaller list as input. You're going to merge those together, and the result should be a now sorted list of all the values of the two smaller lists. So notice here, that, so these test cases are just testing different kind of making certain that you correctly um, are getting the right eye. So here, uh, like in the, the second test, test case here, uh, Cypher should come first when we compare these because Cypher is from Morpheus, uh, but then M and N become come before T. So you should end up copying the values from the upper list for the next two iterations. And at that point, the upper list is exhausted. So, so the last value from the lower list uh, should end up being copied there. Um, all right, any questions about merge? Pass two. So, like I was saying, if you get merge working, uh, it should make creating a merge sort member function relatively easy. Okay, so this is going to be a, a recursive version of a merge sort, right? So, so the way this works, um, let's let's pick something um, a little bit more general here. So here, you know, um, we've got a list with three values in it, but they're not sorted, right? So if we call so sort doesn't take any input. It doesn't return a result. So, so what it does is the side effect though is the values in the list, my, my L1 list here, are going to be sorted if they weren't sorted initially. So, so it should end up being M N T, Morpheus at index zero, Neo at index one, and Trent at index two. Um, so the algorithm is this, and, and I think you just need five lines of code. Um, so you're going to reuse the sublist copy constructor to create two sublists. Okay, so if I initially asked to sort a list, um, and my list is size three, um, like this. Okay, so so if my list is size three, uh, I need to create a sublist, or just to make it a little bit easier. I mean, you have to have the, the 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 test working here, but yeah. If let's say we have a list of size eight, so for a list of size eight, I've got an even number of values in the list. So what I want to do is create a, a sublist of the first four values from index zero to three. So if I take eight divided by uh, two, um, I would get four, right? So in that case, I want to do I want to create a sublist using the sublist copy constructor that you did for task one from zero up to the, the mid index. So zero to three or zero to four minus one, right? And I wanna create a second list, an upper list um, um, from index four, the mid value up to you know, the size of the list, right? So that's described here. So inside of the member function, you can do something like this. If, if you calculate the midpoint value, which was like four, like I said last time for, for the a list of size eight, you know, you'd want to do your lower list like this. So you can pass in a reference, you know, you can dereference this, the, this pointer to pass in your list. Uh, and again, you're, you're invoking your sublist copy constructor, and then you do it from zero to the mid minus one, right? Um, and then your upper list would be from mid, you know, you, you want to make a, a copy of a sublist of this from mid, to the, the size, the last index of this list, right? And you have to be careful. So make, make sure it works both for even lists or for odd lists. If I have three values or seven values, you know, you should still correctly uh, split those into. So you'll have two calls to make a lower and an upper list using your sublist copy constructor. Um, and then you just call sort um, on both of these sublists. Okay, so now that I have lower, I just call lower.sort to sort lower. 
and I call upper dot sort to sort upper. Okay, so I guess there are two more uh, lines of code for that. Um, and then you're going to call merge on on this instance uh, where you pass in lower and upper to merge the now sorted um, smaller sublists um, back together into a merge sorted final list. All right. Um, Um, oh, I did. I did skip over one thing. Uh, so yeah. So so there's like two, four, five lines of code. But there is uh, that. That's kind of the general case. Uh, but but you do have to test for the base case. So you have to have have this recursive call to um, sort in somehow. So 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 the the base case is that if the list that you're asked to sort is size zero or one, it is size one or smaller, right? Um. So so again, you should, uh, kind of like I showed in the solution here just now for the previous assignment, you should be able to test and handle both of these, you know, an empty list or a size one list. But, but by definition, a size one list or an empty list is sorted. So in that case, you just return and do nothing if you're asked to sort a size one list. And that will, um, if, if you have that base case correct, that will stop the recursion um, um, when you get down to the size one lists. Um, all right. Um, so I'm already, I'm already to, uh, past, uh, three here. Um, so I'm just going to, there are two more tasks where we're actually going to implement a search. Um, so we're going to implement a binary search, which we talked a little bit about, um, in, um, our materials this week. So, you know, I, I'm, I'm going to be a little bit quicker on this one. Um, I'll leave this. Uh, um, you should implement it as a recursive function again, right? But here's the algorithm for doing a binary search. It has some similarity to the merge sort. So, you, you know, we calculate a middle index, um, and then we test the value at that index. Um, and if the value we're searching for is at that index is smaller, we need to recursively search uh, from zero to that midpoint. Um, and if, if the value we're searching for is bigger, we need to search from that midpoint plus one to the end, right? So, so we're basically breaking the list in half uh, and eliminating half of the list um, uh, in the binary search here, right? Um, but the calling search assumes that the list is already sorted, right? So for example, um, um, if the list isn't sorted, uh, we can call the sort function, which you implemented in the previous task. So yeah, you really can't run these task four tests until you actually have your sort working or else they, they'll fail because the, the list isn't sorted. So we assume that the sort is working. So after we call sort on this list, um, you know, uh, we've got the same 20 values, but, you know, they're in sorted order from Agent Brown up to Woman in Red. Um, and then, you know, binary search basically it returns the index, right? So Morpheus is at index nine. So if we ask to search the list, uh, do a binary search, uh, you pass in the begin and end index uh, for this search here. Um, it should return, it should find that Morpheus ended up being at index nine um, in the sorted list here and so on. Um, And then as a final task five, we, we normally don't, um, we normally wouldn't have a search function like this where you specify like a sub portion of the list or the beginning and end index. So if you look at the test cases for test five um, in um, actually the second set of test cases, this is how we would normally want to use um, the search here. Um, so even if the list isn't sorted, if we call search, uh, we would want it to work. And the way we're going to have it work is, is we're going to first detect. So, so you know, and, and we don't want to say like a sub portion of the list. We just want to say search for the value um, and return me the index where you find the value at, right? So what we're going to do is we're going to detect if the list is not sorted. And if it's not sorted, we're going to call sort on ourselves. 
Um, and then we're going to call the other version of the binary search um, that you create here on the now sorted list, right? Um, so in order to do that, we want to have uh, you want we want to first create um, a uh, member function called is sorted, um, and what this function does is returns um, true if the if the values in the list are sorted and false if they're not. Okay, so is sorted um, is should be relatively easy to implement. So what you do for is sorted generally is um, you check, you start at index zero and you check if index zero is greater than the value at index one. So if it's greater than the value at index one, the answer is false, they're, they're not sorted. But if it's less than um, or equal, then, then the list might still be sorted. So if that in that case, um, you then increment uh, your index to one and you test one to against two, right? Um, so in, again, if one is less than, are equal to two, um, they're potentially sorted, but if, if two is greater, then they're not sorted, right? So here, for example, um, uh, n is less than w, but w is greater than t. So once we get to index one, it's not true that woman in red, w, um, is less than t. So you, you would detect that at that point and return. The answer would be false um, if that is sorted there, right? The only tricky part about this is you have to be careful about running off the end. So you want to go from zero up to not the last index. So, so for a, an array of size 20, you need to go from zero up to index 18, because when you're at index 18, you're going to be checking 18 against index 19. So, so you, you can't have a simple for loop that goes as normal, but, but um, 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 you want to go to size minus one instead of less than size. Um, and make sure that you don't go past the end of the array there. So. Um, and once you have the is sorted working, then basically you're going to implement this version of search that basically uh, first tests if this list is sorted. Um, if it's if, if it returns false that this list is sorted, it will first it will then call sort to make certain the list is sorted, right? And then it will reuse the search that you implemented in the previous task uh, to search the whole list, okay? So you'll call search, but but do the whole list from zero, you know, the begin index will be zero and the index, in index will be, you know, the size of the list. And then whatever result uh, your previous version returns, you return from this version of your search, right? So this should be like a two-liner uh, of code um, where you reuse uh, three, two, well, more three or four lines of code here. So you reuse your is sorted, call sort if it's not sorted, um, and then you reuse the other version of search um, um, to search the whole list. Um, all right. So yeah, I do want to wrap it up. It's already uh, past three here. Uh, anybody uh, want to ask? Like a final question here. If not, um, I'm going to go ahead and end the session here so that I can get this uh, um, video saved and I'll upload as usual. Um, yeah, keep sending questions. I've had a lot of people are making progress. So, you know, a lot of people uh, had some problems with the first one, but but are doing much better now on, on the third assignment. So, you know, if you, if you show pride, even if you did bad on the first assignment or two, um, you know, if you show that you've gotten it by, by this week, you know, um, by the next assignment or so, um, you know, you're still doing okay doing fine. So, all right. So I'll end the session um, and I'll see you guys later then.